All right, let's get this ball rolling. This, this is going to be the, I was going to say the end all be all of the ART board exam discussion, but it, it's not. It's just my version of it. So this is going to be a video about the board itself, not how to study for it or how to prepare for it so much. We're going to talk about what the ARRT board exam is, what it's comprised of, how long it takes, all that kind of stuff. Now, this is a, this is a slow crawl to help you understand what the exam is. Um, if you're this far into the course, then you're interested in radiography, uh, you're excited about radiography, and it's going to get even more exciting as you learn more about it, I promise you. Um, I want you to grab a drink or whatever uh, and, and relax, and let's just go through. This is, today's episode is brought to you by uh, Redberry. Um <laughs> By this time, you know, we were, we're in like uh, video 11 or so. We're getting to know more about the uh, about the world of radiography. And this exam uh, is kind of the uh, cornerstone. You know, in an archway, you've got that one center brick in the middle that holds the whole thing together, and it all rests on that. Uh, this exam is what you have to pass in order to practice what you spent two years learning. Um, now, I, I'll call out that there are still five or six states in America, and America is the only one who does this board. You know, we run across a lot of people from outside of the United States who um, do radio. Of course, radiography is done all over the world. But uh, the in America, in order to perform radiography exams and be certified, and I have to be careful because personally, I I intermix certified and licensed, and, and I shouldn't. It's just years of being sloppy without a license is a state title that you get by applying for the license. You don't you don't necessarily have to take a state exam. You just have to tell the state that you have the national certificate and you pay the state money, like in, in Arizona, for example, where I was where I went to school for X-ray. You just had to pass the, the board exam we're going to talk about today, take that certificate and show it to the state and pay like 75 bucks or something out, 25 bucks, I don't even remember, uh, and you got the license. Of course, it took 30 days to get it to you for some reason, um, but but the ART gets you the certification to work in the United States as a radiographer, and if you if you have issues passing the exam, it's a big problem because, like I said, there's only five or six states left that don't require it to work because you're giving radiation to a patient. That's part of the issue. Um, but even though states that don't require it, many of the hospitals in those states do. So don't, don't be misled into thinking you don't need this exam. You absolutely need this exam, this certification. So um, I'm going to do a couple of things in this video. I say what, what this course is going to uh, evolve into is not just me sharing my knowledge, but I'm going to share with you how to stay current with the knowledge and go find it on your own, how to how to think about this whole thing in a way that you continue to grow with the profession. Um, for example, we're, we're going to talk today about the ART board exam and get all of our material straight from the ARRT. Now, if I, uh, if I, you cannot minimize Zoom when you are recording this meeting. I, well, okay, then I'll just move you to another screen. Um, I am going to open up the actual ARRT website. Well, I'm going to do a lot of things. I'm also going to show you all the videos, uh, as of right now anyway, on YouTube that discuss it. And let's do that. Let's, I'm going to hop back and forth here and see if I can't uh, share screen and then not share screen. Yeah. So share screen. So 
This is YouTube, obviously, and I just typed in the ARRT board exam. Of course, just like Google, you got to add to the top. But as you scroll down, um, these are videos by people telling you about the registry exam. Registry exam is another way of saying board exam, ART board exam. And what I want you, the first thing I want to teach you is to pay attention to who is giving you personal perspective, which trumps who is giving you an advertisement. So this channel called The Radiology Coach clearly is an advertisement, but that doesn't mean it's not coming from a professional, right? It doesn't mean it's not coming from a person who knows and is probably even registered uh, with the ART. Just bear in mind that if they have their own program to teach you how to take the exam, they're going to be biased, right? And so, uh, and this video isn't about how to take it, how to pass it, how to study for it. This is about the exam itself. So what I'm showing you is all these videos are, are registry tips, how to prepare, how I passed. Uh, uh, Tracy, who I highly recommend his channel, you should subscribe to Tracy's channel. Um, he's MRI. X-ray Ray, another highly recommended channel. Um, he's talking about how he studied and how he passed. Uh, Julia Christine, I also recommend. Great vlog. Uh, she used Rad Tech Boot Camp. Again, that's how to study, how to prepare. Uh, same thing here, Dose Grid, Prep and Advice. Um, now, this is what I'm going to review today are things like this. What's actually on the ARRT registry exam? And that's it. That's all your selections right now, which brings me back to why I created my YouTube channel and my blog, the radiologictechnologist.com blog is because there three years ago none of this was out there this is all two years ago one year year ago uh two years ago two years ago two years ago one year ago and so on nine months ago um i started it a little bit over three years ago started sharing everything i had for this reason so this video is valuable to you because there's not a lot of videos out there that go over the actual exam what it is, what's on it, how they design it, uh, what the um, past results have been, uh, which states are the most successful in passing, that kind of thing. So, and then there's me. And then there's Troy, the x-ray guy. Troy, if you look there, that's six years ago. Brother was out there before all of us just being goofy. And the dude uh, nailed it. 370,000 views on this simple video. Uh, kudos to him. Uh, Juan, Juan is fun because Juan's an x-ray tech who's going back to school to be a barber because he doesn't really like healthcare. But yet Juan has a pretty fresh channel where he's telling you all about everything, how to be an MRI tech, how to be a phlebotomist, and he's an x-ray tech. But anyway... Uh, so let, let's get to it. The point of this is about this right here. The ART, see up here, ART.org. We are on the board exam page from the people who give the exam. There's no question as to whether this is valid information or not. It's not opinion. It's not from somebody outside the field telling you what they think it is. This is the source, okay? And you with your brain can always go back here on your own and see what's changed or what's coming up. Or as you'll learn, there are different pathways you can take to do different things in the field. This is your source, okay? Okay. So uh, let's just kick it off. The ART certification and registration exams help determine that you have the knowledge and skills needed to both function as an entry-level rad tech and provide safe, effective patient care. They say that because that's all in the exam. Entry-level stuff that you should know, and not just how to take x-rays, but how to provide safe care to your patients. Now, how do they create these exams? Creating exams is a multi-step process at the RT. We first conduct a practice analysis of each discipline. Discipline meaning x-ray, CT, MRI, ultrasound, IR, whatever. And they survey rad techs in the field 
to ask what are entry level tasks that you perform regularly, not far out there crap because you're in some ortho specialist office doing some weird fifth angle thumb x-ray on the snuff box or something regularly performed. It says it right there. Okay, so first they start off by serving people in the field and asking what they do on a regular basis. Then they analyze that and they create specifications for what each exam should cover. So that's your broad umbrella of the different subject matters, okay? And then they actually have a team of question writers, professional question writers uh, that select an appropriate collection of those subjects and, and items um, to test on. And then you, we can click here to look at the development process. I'm gonna skip that part for now. Maybe I'll go back to it at the end, but basically they just have a team of expert writers and there's scientific methods behind um, how they do them and whether they should throw them out or sometimes they even put them in an exam and so many people miss them. They're like, clearly that was a suck, sucky question. They throw it out, it doesn't affect you. But the format, the ART exams are computer based. Okay, so obviously they used to be on paper back in the day, and then they went to computer. Back in the day, when you'd go take this stupid exam, even when it was on computer, you had to wait like 30 plus days to get your results in the mail. Uh, now it's it's ready instantly. You are so lucky. Um, a tutorial at the start of each exam allows you to answer practice questions and enables you to become familiar with the process. So this video, remember, we're talking about this to help put your mind at ease. That's what this whole series is about, is helping you understand this career so that you're not as stressed about it. There's not this big mysterious bubble around it that you don't understand. And this particular video, because everybody, everybody stresses about this exam, and for good reason. And when I show you the pass rates, you'll understand why a little bit more. But this is a uh, this exam has built in uh, tutorial at the beginning of it. So when you go to take the exam and I'll walk you through the whole process. But when you sit down to take it, you actually they actually give you time in the beginning to take practice questions and see how you you know what the format is and how you answer it and all that stuff before your clock starts to tick. OK, so um, so there's that. Uh, so that enables you to become familiar with the process and question formats. Now, the duration and length, it's roughly, I believe it's two to two and a half hours, but it actually varies. And so that's why I'm, I'm not going to give you an exact uh, number. I think actually uh, one of these that I really like is, um, was a gal right here, I think. Dose grid, was this her? Let's start off with uh, commercials, of course. Um, if this is the one I'm thinking of, she starts off with. Uh, let's see if I still had it on there. Nope, not on that screen. Bear with me. Um, oh, I don't think this is it. Darn it. Hang in there. I remember I said slow crawl. Maybe it was this one. Anyway, the one I'm looking for shows uh, how many hours I think they give you on the exam. And, and like I said, it does vary. But no, this isn't it either. So sorry, I'll find it another time. Um, let me hit stop on that so you'll quit talking. Uh, do, 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 do. Shoot, I can't remember who it was. Um, that's what I used, by the way, Appleton Lang, that yellow and white book that was just right there. That's what I used to pass, but more, more of that on another video. Um, so test duration and length. The ART's practice analysis advisory committees determine the length of each exam. The committees consider factors, including the skills needed for each discipline, and the number of categories and content specifications. The time allowed to complete an exam is based on the number of exam questions. Your schedule also allows time to complete the tutorial, and there's a non-disclosure agreement before the exam that you, you have to read and digitally sign as well. That's all calculated into your time. So um, how to prepare for the exam. 
We'll go over this in a minute, but this is all the different uh, sections of the exam. We'll do some exam statistics. And so let's bust into that. So here's the exam content. And, and uh, if, if you know, feel free to jump around if you want to get to different areas. I'll try to do uh, show notes or whatever you want to call it, time time stamps in the, in the footnotes at the end when I go back through this. But, um, you know, the ART gives a ton of exams. So what you have to do is, is jump through to radiography. That's the one we're talking about and get to that. So here's the radiography, ARRT, Board of Exam, content specifications, right? And here's your current date. It was approved January of 21 and implemented January of 22. So there are different categories, and these are the numbers of questions in each category. Patient care has 33 questions. And the subcategories in patient care, there's only one here, patient interaction and management. So you have 33 questions. I should, I should preface this by, they should preface it by saying how many questions are in here. But I guess, so 200 is what they, is what they say on here. But I'm pretty sure, if I remember right, they throw in an extra 20 questions that they call pilot questions. And you're not going to get scored on them. I mean, they may score them. As they, I think they actually score them as a way of testing out new questions. And then they look at that curve, how many people failed, how many people got it right. Maybe it's a bad question because everybody, you know, 85% of the people failed that question or whatever. So you're going to have 200 questions um, that apply to your score, but there's going to be 220 because they put pilot questions in there to test the waters on new questions. So backing up, uh, there's 33 questions on patient interaction and management. And then under safety, there's two subcategories. There's radiation physics, or they call it radiobiology, and there's radiation protection. Now, this is the category. Let's just be transparent. There's the elephant in the room. That's the class that scares everybody because let's, let's face it, physics is just not that fun of a class unless that's your thing. And some people... Cool, good for you. But it's it's a hard class if you're not good with that stuff or if you've never had, a lot of us never had physics until we got to x-ray school. Um, and so, uh, but don't let that scare you because the more time that goes by, the more resources are being put on the internet to help you understand the physics. So <laughs> 50 questions, excuse me. <laughs> 50 questions on your exam are going to come from, from the physics and the rad protection. And the rad protection, and, and this thing will tell you what's under each one of these subcategories too, but rad protection is about keeping your patients safe from the radiation and yourself and everybody else in the room. So then the next 51 questions are image production, and the subcategories are image acquisition and evaluation so that's how to get it, how to take the x-ray. We say take the x-ray, but it's really a misnomer. We're not taking an x-ray. We're, we're emitting radiation through grids and all kinds of things, emulsifiers and stuff. And then we, we get this latent image back that gets processed. Anyway, uh, we'll just say take an x-ray because that's the most common thing said out there. So image acquisition and evaluation is 26 questions. And equipment operation and quality assurance is another 25. So you, you see how they kind of separate out the how of taking an x-ray. And this is separate from doing the x-ray because that's the next that's the next topic. How you acquire it, the, the science behind it, versus how to operate the equipment and make sure your equipment's functioning properly, doing quality assurance stuff on your equipment. So that's 51 questions total. And then you get to 66 questions, which is the meat of the test. You know, it out, outweighs everything else. Are your actual procedures how you do them? And so they break it down into three subcategories. Head, spine, and pelvis. There's 18 questions there. And then thorax and abdomen, you know, which is the torso. There's 20 questions there. And then extremities, arms and legs, right? So when you, if, if you're one of those people who sees a big thing like a, a, the human body and all the parts and you start to panic or you start to think, how am I ever going to remember all this stuff? It's all about chunking. 
That's one method of learning called chunking, where you break it down into parts and you learn those parts. There, there's the old adage, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You don't think about the whole big thing. You just start chomping away one bite at a time. So when it comes to x-raying the body, you've got head, spine, and pelvis, and then you've got the thorax and abdomen, and then the extremities. So that makes up your 200 questions. And then it actually breaks it down for you right here on the ART website under the patient care. So the patient care is right here, patient care, patient interactions. You're going to have 33 questions on it. And here you go. It starts to kind of give you the outline of what those questions are going to be. Now, is it the actual questions? No, they can't do that. And we can lose our license if we tell anybody what questions we saw on the exam. So for one, don't ever ask anybody that just took it what questions were on there, because if they get caught, they could lose their license. And don't go fishing through forums asking people for questions because they're not going to tell you. Um, so you can look through here and I'm not going to go through the entire thing. I know I said we we're going to do a slow crawl, but I'm not going to go through every single thing here. Um, but I'm showing you that you can go here and see everything that's covered. And, and what you should know, the real world experience here is that when you buy a study guide of whichever one you, you choose, because there's a bunch of them out there now. But for example, I bought the Appleton and Lang study guide, which um, at the time there was Mosby's and Appleton and Lang, I believe, were the two. Um, now you got a whole bunch of them, but they are books with practice exams and a CD that comes with the one I bought. And this was 2005, um, came with a CD that had a thousand practice question, ex questions, exam questions, a thousand of them. And it was, you know, it was like 50 in each one of these categories. And all I did is I, I locked myself away in a library for a week. And from eight to five, Monday through Friday, I went into a room that had a big erasure board and I had my laptop and I just pounded out one bite at a time of the elephant, 25 questions. I'd studied them until I learned them all, until I knew them all. And then I went to the next 25 questions and I studied them all and I learned them all. And then after I completed those, I went back to the first one and made sure I remembered that. And then I did the second set and then I moved to the third set and I studied them until I knew them all. And then I went back and did it again, right? And that's how you retain. And that's that's in another video that I'll do. And I've already written the article is how to pass your ART boards. And I'll link to it. If you want to go look at that, I go over all these scientific methods on how to study and pass. And that's one of them. But um, whenever you, you know, I'm showing you what's on there now based on the people who write the exam. But, but when you get out there in the real world and you go to buy the exam material, that's how it's going to be presented is just a whole bunch of questions that you're going to have to figure out how to implant in your brain long enough to pass the exam. And so here's your patient care stuff. There's ethical and legal aspects. It goes over patient rights, consents, um, legal issues, verification of you know, making sure you have the right patient, common terminology. And you'll have a legal ethics class. There's actually a, a medical legal class that should be in your x-ray program that covers that part. Um, interpersonal communication, you've got to learn about, you know, verbal and nonverbal because you've got written orders. You've got to learn how to take nonverbal cues from your patients when you know things are uncomfortable, whatnot. Um, explanation of medical terms, patient education, how to explain procedures to patients, um, ergonomics and monitoring. That plays into safety because you have to keep your body mechanics imbalance you have lifting with your legs not your back how to transfer patients how to roll patients uh you know how to let a person that's falling kind of fall into you and slide down your body to the floor instead of you trying to catch them you know under the armpits or whatever because you'll yank your back out ergonomics and monitoring are a big part of it and then medical emergencies like uh contrast allergies non-contrast allergy reaction like latex um, that's all under this patient care and then it goes on to infection control, how to be uh, sterile, uh, what the CDC expects for hand hygiene and things like that. You've got to learn the uh, transmission-based precautions for when you go into different patient rooms, they may be on a contact precaution or a droplet or an airborne precaution. You've got to understand what that means. You've got to gown up. you got to glove up. you got to put an N95 on. You have to know all that stuff. 
because you don't want to be transferring this crap all over the hospital, um, how to deal with hazardous materials, and then a little bit of pharmacology. We don't we don't touch a lot on pharmacology. I'm I'm on the fence on that. I think we should know more, but at the same time, we already have to know a lot of stuff. So pharmacology, I mean, this is really what we kind of lean on our nurses for and our pharmacists, obviously, but nurses go through a lot more pharmacology because they're the one giving that stuff out. But when they, when any, if anybody says, well, you're an x-ray tech or, or they say x-ray techs don't give medicine. Yeah, we do. We do. And we give more than one. So we do have to understand it. And that's why we have pharmacology on our board exams. So it goes over patient history, uh, medication reconciliation, pre-meds, contraindications, how to give meds. There's I, We give IV meds. We give oral medication. Uh, we do it through uh, enemas and uh, uh, BE, barium enemas. Um, it goes over venipuncture because we have to draw blood and start IVs. The different contrast types because we have different types of contrast medication that we give. Um, Lab values, we have to understand a little bit out of the lab because we have to know if our patient's kidneys can handle filtering out the contrast we give them. Uh, and then reactions, we have to understand the difference in the reactions because we're right there. If they have a reaction on our table, it's us that's running the show until we get a, a nurse or a doctor in there. So that rounds out that first section of patient care. Those are the things. Uh, so, so not tough, right? That's None of that screams something that you can't figure out. And I promise, I promise you, you can learn it. The next section is uh, the radiation physics and radiobiology. So, you know, this is just that thick science stuff that you just have to figure out how to remember it. And and the the you know, I'm the kind of learner who um, has to visualize it. Like if I can create a story in my brain about how something works and see pictures with it and associate new word associations, that's how I do it. But everybody's different. You got to figure that out. So in radiation physics, uh, you're going to have the X-ray production, which involves electrons and focusing of electrons and all that stuff. Target interactions with your Bramschlung, uh, the X-ray beam. You got frequency and wavelength and all that stuff. Beam characteristic, the inverse square law. You'll hear a lot about um, photon interactions. You got scatter, Compton scatter. Attenuation just means, you know, as, as the X-ray beam, and this goes for ultrasound too, if you're thinking about ultrasound, as your ultrasound wave or your X-ray beam goes through a tissue, uh, it's going to be absorbed to some degree, right? Like if you think about, um, I don't know, throwing a rock uh, into water and watching it sink or throwing a rock into mud and how it sinks slower because it's thicker, that's how our tissues are. When you shoot an X-ray through the body, you're going to go through skin blood, bone, muscle, uh, fat, and each one of those layers has a different density level that the x-ray beam is either going to go through faster or slower, and you learn how, how that works and how that affects your x-ray the way it looks in the end, because the thicker it is, the, the more, more juice you got to give it, right? So you'll learn about that. That's 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 a lot of what the radiation physics is about. And then there's all the units of measurement that we use, gray, sieverts, um, all that stuff, uh, radio sensitivity, the dose response relationships, um, cell survival, oxygen effects, somatic effects. You got to worry about, you know, you, you'll learn how it affects different parts of the body. Like it, it hits it hits our eyes, our thyroid and our gonads the worst and, and mammary glands. That's the ones we worry about getting excessive radiation to you. Um, it's carcinogenic, which means, you know, it can cause cancer, uh, early versus late versus chronic, deterministic. Uh, and so is there more on that? Yep. So there's one more page on radiation. So this was the, the physics of it all, how it all works, how it gets to the body, what it does to the body. And then you go to the radiation protection. How do we be safe? So you start out by minimizing patient exposure. That's kind of our mantra as uh, ALARA, A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, as low as reasonably achievable or as low as reasonably acceptable is kind of our motto, which means we'll give radiation to the patient to achieve an X-ray, but we're gonna give the lowest radiation dose possible to obtain a diagnostic image, right? I mean, we could hammer them 
and get a, a good image, or we can lighten up a little bit on the radiation and still get an image good enough to be diagnostic, but not use as much radiation. That's what we want to do. Um, so you're gonna have to learn how to how to create that beam, and that's your KVP and your mass. That's your that's your time and your density of what you're giving. Uh, and there's probably some program director going nuts with how I just said that, but doesn't matter. Uh, and then your automatic exposure control. See, we, we kind of cheat now. Back in the day, you had to know exactly how much juice and for how long to give it. Uh, and that was it. And then automatic exposure control came in that kind of could sense it on the other end and, and cut off the beam for you before you baked it. Uh, so now you have, and again, that program director is probably squirming. But hey, this is layman term stuff, I guess. I mean, I'm not layman, but... Anyway, the, the AEC helps to, to uh, automatically control that beam now for you. And then there's post-processing now that cleans up the image for you, which is even luckier for you. But you're going to learn in the radiation protection how to create the beam and control the beam, use beam restriction through collimation and things like that. And then patient considerations, how you position them, your communication to them to tell them you got to stop moving when I take the picture or it'll be blurry. Uh, and they don't listen. Uh, kids, pediatrics, uh, obesity, the, the fatter, the harder it is to get through. I mean, try doing hip x-rays on a 500 pound person. It's tough. Um, filtration, uh, let's see, image receptors, the grids, uh, and then there's fluoroscopy. So fluoroscopy is a type of x-ray that is it's like like an x-ray is a photograph like what you see behind me is a photograph right imagine i can hold down the button and turn it into a video camera and watch that skull move around but it's still an x-ray that full-time video of an x-ray is fluoroscopy and we use fluoroscopy to watch the uh, to evaluate the function of things so like this picture behind me if we wanted to do a swallow study, it's a legitimate exam to see how a person's able to swallow or if it's getting stuck somewhere, we will have them take a drink and be imaging them from the side. And we can watch the contrast because it shows up white on the screen. We can watch them drink it and it goes down the throat and we can see where it goes. We can see if a little bit pools in a certain place and, and if they have difficulty swallowing it, that's fluoroscopy and you're going to have to learn about it. So fluoroscopy, it goes over how it's, you can pulse it kind of like different frames per second, like a photo or a video, um, exposure factors, grids, positioning, uh, the time that you're on the button, making that fluoroscopy go live because that's recorded, um, all kinds of things to do with fluoroscopy. And this is, if you're aware of how things work in California, um, California, for some reason, was the only state in the country that made technologists take a completely separate exam for fluoroscopy. You had to be licensed in x-ray and fluoroscopy to work there, which was ridiculous. And they finally, just a couple of years ago, realized that was an unfair burden on technologists. And so they, they did away with it. They said, okay, if you graduated x-ray school after 2011 or something like that, we, we think now that you understand it good enough that you don't need a whole separate exam for it. Uh, so you don't have to take it. But if you're a tech from before then, licensed before then, certified before then, um, you still have to take this stupid exam. But anyway, fluoroscopy is covered in our general ARRT board exams. Uh, and then here's that alara I told you about. <clears throat> and it's about, uh, it says personal protection, but it's also for the patient. Um, and it goes over primary beam. And then you actually have secondary, you know, you shoot, you shoot, think of, Think about you, you You drop a rock in water and it hits the water and goes down, but it also splashes up and out, right? That That's a scatter of water around where the rock hit. Radiation does the same thing. When you hit the, uh, the plate that you're putting the image on, you go through the patient, hit the plate. Some of it kind of bounces back and some of it bounces off the patient too, the different things it's hitting going through the patient and scatters. And so that's a secondary radiation. Uh, leakage from the tube, um, and then uh, protection. We Our big thing is time, distance, and shielding, uh, and you'll learn more about that. I don't need to go into it, but there's, if you stand six feet away from what you're x-raying, you, you shouldn't get any radiation yourself. That's why when you watch people do x-rays, you know, they'll walk the patient in the room and put them up next to the wall board and say, stand here and don't move, and then they walk back to the control room and say, 
take a deep breath and hold it and they hit the button they're far enough away you're never going to get radiation back there it's all at the board um so anyway you'll learn more about that and then and how to shield <clears throat> which is another big thing in our field now <clears throat> studies show you don't need to shield patients anymore but we're not going to get into that here i have an, i have two articles on it <clears throat> and i discuss it in some videos but uh, studies show you don't need to put lead on people anymore our machines have gotten so advanced that the dose is tiny and uh and and people that uh, studies show that when you put lead on people they actually might put it on maybe covering a little bit of the anatomy that needs to be x-rayed and they shoot the x-ray and then they go look and they go, oh crap i covered part of the femoral head with the lead so they go move the lead and they reshoot the patient well that patient just got two x-rays instead of one so they got more dose so was it worth it no so um, protected devices, uh, special considerations for mobile units, and, and you got C-arms and stuff and drapes that you use. So have, you think about, you know, like a car wash, they got the drapes, the things that are hanging down, and you got to drive through them. They kind of have that on, on some uh, x-ray machines, fl uh, fluoroscopy tables and stuff, so that the beam can't come out at you. But um, anyway, you'll learn all about that. Uh, bucky slot covers, timers. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then the radiation exposure monitoring. See that word dosimeter? The dosimeter is the little badge you'll see all of us wearing. Everyone near radiation has to wear one. All the people, the surgeons and everybody in the OR have one on uh, if there's going to be C-arm in the room. Um, and that dosimeter is just a little badge that you change out monthly and it it you wear it you either wear it here or you wear it on your waist. Some places tell you where to wear it, others don't. But you wear it where you're gonna get your usual exposure from being a tech. And every month they get sent in to a company that reads it and tells you how much radiation you got. And there's rules about what happens if you have radiation on your batch. So if you go, if you go to a certain level more than you should have, you'll get a warning that, hey, you need to watch your, you're standing too close to something, something's going on. And you need to be careful and you get a warning. And if you're higher than that, you could even get either suspended from work for a certain period of time until that dissipates in your system. <clears throat> or you could be told you can't work in the OR anymore or you can't work in the OR for the next three months because your badge reading was too high. You're going to have to work in the ER or whatever. So they do monitor how much you get. So that, that's a concern of some people that are looking into this is, am I going to get radiation? Am I going to die from it? Am I going to grow a third arm? Um, we actually were taught how to do it correctly. We're taught how to protect ourselves and we're monitored with these badges. Um, and this stuff is checked at high levels in the hospital and the radiology department can get in big trouble if they don't pay attention to these things <clears throat> and, and employees can sue. Uh, so that's the uh, dosimeters and how to use them. Uh, and then personal monitoring, et cetera, like it says embryo fetus exposure. If you're a on a clinical rotation, you're a female and you're pregnant, you have to wear a second badge down near your belly to give a second dosage reading for that abdominal area. So that is the radiation protection. How, how are we doing so far? Are we hanging in there? Uh, if, you're, if you're hanging along, then that means you're really interested. Kudos to you. You're my kind of people. So next section, image production. Uh, this, this again, remember, this is how you take the exam, get the exam, acquire the, the exam, acquire the image, uh, but it's not the protocol. That's a separate thing. How, like how to x-ray a hand, there's a protocol to it. The ways that you put the hand, the angle of the beam, how far away from it, the technique, that's the protocols. This is the image acquisition, how to, how to set the uh, acquisition. So, See, this is where I can get all geeky and get too deep into it, but this is just about the exam. So I got to keep reminding myself, I'm just telling you about the exam and what's on the exam. So this image acquisition talks about, remember, MAS or mass and KVP is the timing and how much juice you're giving a patient. OID and SID, that's object to image distance or, or how, so if I'm x-raying a hand and I put it right on the image plate, uh, that OID is like next to nothing. But if I were to put a pad under that hand to raise it up, now I've got distance between the hand and the and the the uh, detector that's going to collect the image. And the, some things change when you add an air gap in between like that. So that makes a difference. The OID and then the SID uh, is how far the cam the camera or the X-ray machine is from the image receptor. 
And again, how long it goes through the air uh, changes everything. Like chest x-rays, you're typically 72 uh, inches away. 72, yeah, yeah, sir. 72, yeah, 72 and 40. I had to think about feet or inches there. Uh, focal spot uh, is, is uh, a part of the beam. Grids are inside the detector uh, that kind of filter, think of them as lines that filter the beam when it comes through. Um, tube filtration, beam restriction, motion, and on. So these are all the particulars that you're going to learn in school about the creation of the x-ray image and, and how you do it. Um, a technique chart, I've got an article on that on my blog. That, sh that It's just a chart that shows um, different techniques, like for a hand, you put the MAS at this number and the uh, KVP at this number. For the head, you do it at the, the technique chart. is just a big cheat sheet of the techniques you use, the numbers you use to do different x-rays. Um, fixed versus variable, special considerations like shooting through casts or pathological factors, age, BMI or obesity. If you got contrast media, you change your technique a little bit. So technique chart goes over how to set the technique. Uh, AEC, I told you about it, kind of controls it for you a little bit. Um, and then there's a little bit more of the physics behind digital image characteristics, uh, contrast, image signal, uh, image identification, uh, legal considerations like putting the patient's name on the image. Then you can't go share that image in the public because it has patient information on it. Um, and then the criteria for image evaluation, right? So there's actually a formula for how to know you took a good x-ray. Uh, there's the exposure indicator, quantum, uh, I learned it as model, um, exposure error, the contrast, the spatial, all these things are factors that that you can really geek out on and, and get excited about to show, look, look what I did on this x-ray, look at these numbers. And then you get into the equipment um, operation, and, and we, we kind of as techs have to take care of that equipment to a certain degree, and then you've got engineers that do the rest, but we do have to do some stuff ourselves. So uh, you have to understand the equipment. There's the generator, the transformer. You have to know the basic principles of how those things work. Uh, phase versus pulse and then frequency, the tube loading. We, we, we warm up our tubes, our x-ray tubes by doing sample uh, exams and stuff that just kind of warm it up a little bit. It's like starting your car to let it warm up before you drive it on a cold day, that kind of a thing. So you don't just jump in, turn it on and go cranking down the road. Uh, components of the radiographic unit. You've got your console where you, you know where you stand and do your numbers or whatever. You've got the X-ray tube that puts it out, the electron source, all that stuff. The AEC and how it works. Uh, manual exposure controls. If you end up at a chiropractor's office, no, I'm kidding. They always have old equipment. Uh, image receptors. You know the different types of um, our 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 world has evolved a lot in the last 20 years, and you'll learn about that in school, but you know, when, when I started in 2003, there were still places that were developing on film. And then I saw the CR revolution, computed radiography, where you did away with that nasty film chemical garbage. And then we went to digital radiography, which means you shoot the image and it shows up right there on the screen. No, no more running the cassette through a processor and waiting 15 seconds or whatever per image for it to come out the other side and go shoot another x-ray. So you're going to learn about all those different receptors, which is really cool. And then the components of a fluoroscopic unit, you know, the C-arms and the, and the tables that do fluoroscopy. Um, what else? Recording systems, viewing systems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Bucky. So, so, you know, you have the cassette that you put x-ray images on, or they're called detectors now. You, you have to put them in a, in a holder that's called a Bucky for some reason. So if you're laying flat on a table and you pull out this tray and you put your detector, your cassette, and then you shut the tray and then you shoot an image on it, that thing's called a bucky. And if you're standing at a wall and you got your patient standing against it and behind it is the is the tray, that's the bucky. So you learn about the bucky and, the, and how it's assembled and uh, and the filters in the buckies are a little bit different. You got rotating and compensating filters. And then there's image processing, right? So once you shoot the image, uh, if you're on CR, you've got a processor that has to take that latent image off the emulsifier and do all this magic to it. Or if it's digital, same thing, post-processing and all that stuff. 
So that's what all this uh, image processing is for. Um, data for display, post-processing, brightness, contrast, region of interest, cropping, matching, stitching. You'll learn all that stuff. And then finally, here at the end, this imaging informatics, that's your that's your software system that's running the whole thing, right? Your HIS, your RIS, your EMR, and your EHR. You'll learn about all those different. We're still in this place in the radiology world where not quite everything is communicating. So you can think of, you can think of maybe a hospital as this file system, this file cabinet that has these text documents, right? The medical chart. And here we are in radiology, this digital picture archival, picture archival computer system, I believe, PACS. Uh, we've got to figure out how to get our digital images into a text-based file. And so we, uh, we somebody came along and, and made these DICOMs. So you think about like a Word document, it's a dot .doc or an Adobe Acrobat is a, a dot .pdf or PowerPoint is a PPT. We are a DICOM, D-I-C-O-M. And our images end in that. And that protocol, that language is what allows our images to be inserted into the rest of the healthcare file, if you would. Um, but there are still issues with that system. Um, like doctors in the ER, if they do uh, if they do a, a pocket, ultrasound image of something themselves, there's no way to get that image into the file and they end up taking a picture with their phone and email it to themselves. There are some hitches in the giddy up, let's say, that haven't been fully figured out yet for the world of radiology, uh, but it's coming. So anyway, um, you've got your, your electronic medical record or electronic healthcare record. That's just your system that holds all the medical records together. Uh, and then the hiss and the wrists are all of our radiology systems that talk to each other. And the PAC system is what we view our images on, right? Like this image behind us is viewed on a PAC system. So you'll learn about all that. You don't necessarily have to know it all because you've got PACS administrators that deal with that stuff. Uh, you have to focus on how to, your job is to focus on how to get the best image possible with the equipment that you're given to work with, including the patient that you're given to work with, right? And then finally in that category, image production, we talk about quality control. And there's always, the directors of the department are always having to follow quality control protocols and do reports on how are we improving our quality. So there's beam restriction that can help in that central weight ray alignment, um, malfunctions that you should know, digital image receptor systems, QC tests that you can run. You know, you can, you can do, uh, uh, tests on the detectors to make sure they're operating correctly. Uh, I mean, these things are getting really smart now. A detector that will actually know if you drop it and damage it, it has a reporting mechanism in it that will keep track of that. And it'll know that you were the tech that, were, that was holding it when you're the one that dropped it. So, you're not yes, I did. So digital imaging receptor systems, QC test, display, shielding. So there's a they go over shielding just a little bit. Uh, testing lead aprons and gloves. So we wear lead aprons when we need to. There's lead gloves if you need to. There's lead glasses if you need to. Um, and we test those annually. We lay them on a table. We shoot an x-ray at them. We, we have a cassette underneath it and we see if any of that beam came through, and if it's greater than a quarter, I believe, then that lead has to get destroyed or returned for a refund or whatever. Um, we have to quality control our lead aprons, okay? Now, we're on the procedure section, and I know we've been going for a little bit, so bear with me. The procedure section is where you start to go over the actual how to image the different body parts, the protocol. The, the competencies they're called in your clinical rotations. You have to get checked off and signed off on competencies, meaning you are competent in performing these exams. So you'll see right here where we start with head, the skull is the first thing. <clears throat> there are actually several ways to image the skull and they're all kind of listed right there. Uh, so when you think of the skull, you know, when you're new and you don't know, you think, well, the skull is this whole thing, right? Well, it is. But if you're wanting to just image, say, the uh, orbits, which is number six on there, there's a certain technique and certain things you do just to image the orbits that doesn't include everything else. 
uh, and there's ways to make that image better. Like if you just shot a full skull, you're not going to get as good of an image of the orbital floors and whatnot as then if you were to cone down in and just do that area. So this section of the ARTs website just shows you the positioning, the anatomy, the uh, procedural adaptation, and the evaluation of the display uh, for all the different parts that we do. And, it, and it's going to seem kind of overwhelming, but the body's complex, and we image every single part of it a lot of different ways. And you can learn it, and you can do it. Don't worry, just one bite at a time. So here's head, spine, and pelvis as head and spine uh thorax it's, it's all broken down in the individual and we will do some different things like in the abdomen uh, abdomen the abdomen and gi series down here you'll see uh swallow studies that's what i was just talking about with fluoroscopy where you're watching somebody swallow um same thing we watch it go through the the uh the uh uh abdomen and watch things move around in there the small bowel the large bowel um, we put it in through an enema tip and check out the distal, uh, gosh, I can't even remember. I've been so long since I've done a BE, uh, the distal colon, Lot, lots of things, the surgical, don't let the big words scare you. You'll learn them. ERCP, cystourethrography, all these things. Some of this isn't done anymore, uh, but you still have to learn it, um, and so there's extremity procedures. You got upper extremity, lower extremity, and then there's some other stuff we do, bone age, uh, arthrography. Um, and then this is uh, attachment A here is the nitty gritty. This is the actual breakdown of what you're going to have to know. Uh, and it is the head you're going to do on a skull exam. You're going to have to know the AP axial, the lateral, the PA axial, the PA the submental, the SMV is called submental vertex. A trauma could be in there, both cross table and uh, AP axial, trauma AP. So these are all the different types. Sorry, it's doing the whole thing. I can't just do that left side. But in a skull, uh, A through I are all the different types of views you can take of the skull. And then if you were only doing facial bones, then there's A through D of how to do the facial bones. And then, and there's books that will help you with this stuff. There are positional books that each page will have each one of these, and it'll show you what the head looks like on the table and where your x-ray beam is entering and how, how far away it is from the patient and what your technique should be. And there's, there's books that show you all this stuff. I'm just showing you what's on the exam, right? So let's try and blaze through the rest of this real quick. Uh, then it's telling you some of the terminology that you need to know that goes with this. Um, you know, when a patient's laying down, they can be laying down a bunch of different ways, face down, on their back, kind of in between the two, uh, lateral, we go through all that stuff. Uh, if the feet are up and the head's down or vice versa, there's terminology for that. Uh, standing up versus sitting up. Um, so you've got to understand, and you'll learn this in school, all the different body positions and all the different planes, coronal and sagittal and axial and all that stuff. And there's some pictures of it. And we're at the end of what's on the exam. So was that it? So we got through to the studies. Yep. So procedures. So just to just to finish that section up out of the 200 questions, 33 are from patient care. 50 are from radiation safety and physics, 51 are from image production, 66 are from how to do the procedures. And as you take the mock exams, and your school will make you take mock exams, but you can take them on your own also by buying any one of the different products. When you take these practice exams, they will tell you which one of these sections you're sucking at, and then you can go back and put more attention on those areas. So if you're the kind of person that gets the patient care down super easy and you get it down and you nail that every time, you can stop worrying about that a little less and start worrying more about what it is you need to put more of your focus on. So use that to your advantage as you're taking these exams. So that is the content specifications. Now let's just briefly do the um, exam statistics. So we did this one already. Here's the exam statistics. So remember, we're just talking about the primary eligibility pathway. It's your first primary, it's your first exam, first time in the field. If you're doing it, uh, if you're doing a second uh, exam for something else, it'd be a post-primary. 
Um, so 2021, well, it goes over, and again, this is the RT website. You can always go straight here for the real information. But they, they basically do this weird uh, scoring. It's called a scaled score system, which means you've got to get a 75 or higher to pass, but it does not mean, score of 75 does not mean that you answered 75% of the test times correctly. It's a weighted scoring system. So if you want to understand it better, read this part of the of the website. But here's the here's the data. Radiography, first time candidates for 2021, there were 12,252 people that were eligible for the first time to take the exam. And we're not talking about people that came back, that's your repeat column. And we're not talking about people whose licenses expired and they decided to get back into it. That's the reinstatement folks. So the total number of people that took it were 12,252. And, and that was from 27 states. That doesn't really matter. But down here, radiography, um, the, for some reason, they're giving you a percentage to pass, which doesn't matter because they already told you it's not a percentage thing. But they're just saying you needed roughly 67% correct answers to pass. But the real number here is your pass rate. Out of those 12,252 people that took the exam for the first time, 83.8% passed. What does that mean? If you round it to 80%, that means one in five failed. That's kind of scary. And that's where all the stress comes from. And I can tell you, this is way better than the ultrasound boards through the ARDMS. They're way worse. But you don't have to worry about that. You're going into x-ray. So what you can see there are the numbers on the pass rate. So you can see that eight, almost 84% of the people pass the x-ray. If you're thinking about nuke med, less than 80% pass that. If you're thinking about radiation therapy, it's about the same. See, here's, this is a different, this is ultrasound, but this is through the ARRT. The gold standard for being certified in ultrasound is through the ARDMS. Um, but even through the ART, it's a 56% pass rate. I mean, that's half. Yeah. That's that's just wrong. There's something wrong, and they need to figure out why these tests are too stinking hard. But that's another day. And MRI has got a 66% pass rate, and this is where you go. You can't go somewhere else for an MRI certification, but but ART has been the gold standards for that. So, yes, one in five fail the ART board exam. But here's another thing: nobody will tell you. That's not because all 17% of those people who failed, it doesn't mean they got bad school. It doesn't mean, I mean, there's a lot of things that can cause this. I have taken a board exam after working a night shift, uh, working all week or whatever, and I was dead tired and I knew better. And I went and took a board exam straight from my night shift to the exam. And I took it and I failed it. And I, it was stupid. I was exhausted and I, I didn't have, I, I wasn't rested enough and I could have studied better. So when you think about how 17% of these people failed, were they sick when they went and took it? Were they, uh, were they just flat out unprepared? Uh, are they bad test takers and suffer from test anxiety? Um, did the school not prepare them properly? Did they buy some off-brand study guide that they weren't sure about or didn't, they thought it was good, but maybe it didn't prepare them accurately? I've heard of that before. Um, so there's a lot of factors. So when you think about, oh, what if I'm one of those five? If you, by a tried and true and tested study program, go to a, a certified school that's J-certed and uh, has good uh, data for how many people they pass, you can check out a school before you get in it and see how many students graduate and how many pass the boards. If they have a low board pass rate, maybe you don't want to go there. So there's a lot of factors that can go into why people don't pass it, um, but it is a fairly difficult exam. And if you're a person who didn't pay attention and didn't care and somehow you skated by and got passing grades and you graduated the program, but you never really learned it, you will be one of those 17% that don't pass. So you can see right up here, 2,326 people had to come back and take it again. Now, what they don't show is how many of those people passed because that number is actually even less. Because the studies show that if you don't pass it the first time and you go to take it a second time, there's less than the original pass rate the second time around. So um, 
I think that's what I'll conclude with. Uh, exam performance. Oh, so eh, is this valuable? Maybe just a little bit. You're like, what, what, when you think about what section should I study more? It's, it's what you're, what you're showing your results to be on your mock exams, really. But this is another way to look at it. They're showing that the mean scores based on the exams in 2021, the average mean score, like 8.1 is the lowest there on two of them. So equipment operation and quality assurance is what people scored the lowest on and radiation protection. So those needed to be studied a little bit more by the general population of the people who took this exam um, and people passed patient interaction management the highest. The last thing I think I'll show you here is that uh, first time passing rate has been slowly dropping. So more and more people are not passing first time around. Um, and the candidates stayed about the same, you know, COVID dropped us down that particular year, but it's back up. Um, we typically see the same amount of people applying year over year. It's never been a big influx. And this just shows you where they're all coming from. Your highly populated states like California are going to pump out the most. 776 people took the x-ray exam for the first time in California, 1,275 in Texas, where your smaller, less populated states had, had a lot less people. And so that's NukeMed. And so you can go to the website if you want to see how radiation therapy did and all that stuff. Um, but that's going to be it. That is the ARRT board exam in a nutshell. Um, and then if you want to know, so, so when you go, you're going to graduate school, they're going to give you the stamp of approval. They're going to say, get, hurry up and get registered and take your exam. You're going to go to the RT and you're going to pay a big whopping fee to, to, to have a window like a 90 day window, they say, okay, you're, you've paid, we've got your payment, we've proved you passed your program, you have 90 days to go take the exam. Now, call Pearson View, which is a, a nationwide company that only gives exams. And it's like this, this sterile office complex. You walk in there, you have to put all your stuff in a locker, your watch, your wallet, your phone, whatever, keys, um, anything like that in a locker and lock it up. And then they're going to fingerprint you to check you and make sure you are who you are. They're going to take your ID. Um, I mean, everything but an ocular scanner. And then when it's your turn to go take the exam, they're going to they're going to search you and then put you into a room and close the door. And there's probably like, you know, 10 desks with the cubicles. And they're going to say, uh, would you like a pair of headphones that are supposed to be noise canceling headphones, which I recommend. But there's there's pros and cons. The pro is you won't hear everybody else in there tapping their pencils or clickety clacking on their keyboards or whatever. If that kind of thing distracts you. I had a guy one time that had a cough and he just constantly coughed and it drove me insane. Um, and the headphones kind of help. But the problem with the headphones is they can be so noise canceling that I could hear myself breathing. I could hear the <sighs> which can kind of be distracting. Right. So you kind of have to prepare yourself for, for these tests because you're going to be in there for two, two and a half hours. Typically, and I haven't done one in a couple of years, but typically they give you a little eraser board and an eraser marker to write things on. And you might get a calculator. You might not. I, I can't remember. Or I don't know if they do now or not. But um, those eraser boards are, are used and you'll learn this in the study techniques, but you go in and you brain dump down charts that you memorize and you write them down real quick. And then you can set that off to the side and focus on answering questions. And then when you get to things that relate to that chart, you can refer to it and you no longer have to think about the chart because you wrote it down. But you're going to sit there with your headphones on and your eraser board and maybe a calculator, a simple calculator they give you. And if you uh, uh, if you have any questions, you have to raise your hand. They have to come in the room. You're being audio recorded and video recorded the whole time. Um, and like it said, you're going to have a mock exam or mock questions to kind of get to see how it works. You can, if it still works the same, you can flag questions. And here's how I recommend taking this. Here's how I took it. I busted through it and answered everything I knew for sure. Cause you pretty much know what you know for sure. I busted through and, and answered everything I knew for sure. And the stuff that I wasn't 100% sure about, I flagged it. 
And when you get to the end, you can go back and see how many you flagged. You can kind of do a little calculation. Go, okay, well, I flagged 25% of the questions. That means I, if I'm right, I've, I'm at about a 75% of correct answers, which remember, that doesn't mean you got a 75. It just means you got 75% correct. But that made me feel a lot more at ease knowing, okay, I got 75% done that I was pretty sure about. Now I got to go back and, and re redo these flag questions and really pay attention Use the things you learn in the in the test taking modules, like how to, you know, if there's two obviously wrong answers, you weed them out immediately. If there's two real similar answers, they're trying to trick you, or all those things you learn about how to take tests. But you take the exam. Once you're done, be prepared for it to ask you like 50 times if you're sure. Are you sure? Are you sure you're done? Are you sure you want to click that button? Are you sure? Because this is going to end the test. And you're going to start having second doubts. Going, I, I don't know. Why are you asking me that? Are you asking me that because I got something wrong? Did I forget something? And you can go back and check, did you miss something, did you not? But you finally have to hit yes enough times that it, that it ends the test. And then it should give you your score. And there you go. You should have your score right there on the, on the screen. But don't panic because they're also going to give you a printout at the front desk when you leave that says if you pass or failed. And then you give it 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever, for that to report up to, um, to the ART. And... That's the ART board exams. I can't think of anything else to really go over. Um, you are welcome to go through and, and review all of these others, uh, what everybody else says about how to prepare. The, the, more you, the more you learn what's out there on different study techniques and different ways to take exams and different ways to prepare yourself for the exam, the better off you'll be. You just need to pick your own method and, and use it and get good at it and practice it. So I hope this helps explain kind of what the ARRT board exam is. Once you pass it, you're certified nationally to do x-rays, but the state that you work in might also require a state licensure, which a lot of people say it's just a money grab, but it is a way for the state to control how that's happening in their, in their state. Idaho, where I'm at, doesn't care, doesn't require it. And the problem with that is we've got people shooting x-rays that, that never went to x-ray school and don't know what they're doing. And that's bad for the patients. And patients don't know it. Patients, because uh, we've surveyed them, patients think that everybody that shoots an x-ray is, is certified to do so and has been to school for it. And that's not true. So wherever you live, see if they have a state licensure. And if they do, all you do is go down and apply and pay them a fee and prove to them that you have your ARRT board certification, and then they process it and they give you your state exam. And then you're ready to go, ready to make the money. So this concludes the ARRT board exam. I will stop that there. So that's it for uh, what's on the ARRT board exam. I hope this has been helpful. Again, if you have questions, post them in the comment section if you're following this on YouTube. But Again, I'll direct you back to my blog because that's where I'm really posting most of the show notes and all that stuff. So this is a part of a course that starts from day one and goes all the way through. We're, we're first going through what the radiology field is all about. And uh, and then we're going to go into how to get into a school program and how to apply and how to nail the interviews and how to get financing and all that stuff. And this this, this is just going to keep going all the way through till you become a tech and how to get the best job and how to how to do your job and how to cross train into multimodalities, how to make the most money and even how to move up into management if that's what you want to do. So I hope this has been helpful. Got my Red Tech Week shirt on. And uh, I'm Dr. Ron Jones. See you in the next one.